single and married, those are the two places to fall in from God's standpoint. People mess around with those choices, but from God's standpoint, single or married are uh, the two choices we have. What should I do? And it's not so much what could I do. You could do all sorts of things, but what should you do? That's the emphasis. What is the call of God? That's the question. That, that is a real question to ask. What is God calling me to do? That's the thing to wrestle with in all seriousness, in all clarity. What should I do? Because the problem with the church in America is it's overdosed on freedom. It's overdosed on all of its freedom. It's done everything it could do, but not necessarily what it should do. There's so many believers that do all these choices where they waste their time, their energy, their finances, and they waste their youth doing what they could do rather than what they should do. So it's that type of realm we're talking about. What should you do, the, the Lord refers to it as narrow is the way that leads to life. And he says in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. So we want to talk about the call of God for everyone first. There is a call of God for everybody. And so that's the basis of everything else, by the way. The call of God for everyone. We, we want to start, we, we want to begin, let's say it like this. We should begin at the beginning. Start at the beginning. Because if you have a good beginning, you'll probably have a good end. But if you have a wrong be beginning, you can almost guarantee you'll have a bad end. Almost guarantee. So if, if at the opening of your Christian life, if you make fundamentally bad choices as a Christian, you, uh, if you, the book of Hosea says, if you um, sow to the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. And Galatians says, if you uh, sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. So you have to know that. How, how do you set yourself up as a Christian? What's the position you take in the beginning of this conversation? And that's laid out for us in Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So this is the foundation. Start with this foundation. Remember, Romans 1 through 11 is all the information about we're justified and all this information about Israel, and then Romans 12, 1, boom, let's apply it. So that's what we're talking about in light of the, the flow of the word. I urge you, I urge me, we, 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 we urge each other. First thing, offer yourself. Offer yourself without condition. Don't say, Lord, I'll serve you if. I'll serve you if I get what I want. I'll serve you if I live where I want. I'll serve you if I have money. I'll serve you if I have a pretty wife, a handsome husband. None of that. Don't bargain with the Lord. Don't make these conditions. Satan will bargain with you, by the way. In Matthew 4, Satan will strike a bargain. God doesn't bargain with anybody. We're told to offer ourselves a living and a holy sacrifice. So offer yourself. Don't offer yourself as a dead, depressed, isolated person hiding in a basement. <laughs> don't do that. That's, that's, don't be a dead thing. Be a living and holy person. Have the commitment you are going to in your new birth, you're going to come forth in relationship with other believers, and you are making a commitment to personal holiness. It doesn't mean you're sinless. It means you don't have struggles. This is your commitment, right? That's your starting point. So you offer yourself. And the second thing, except to God, which is your reasonable service of worship, he says, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So the word uh, transformed, the second thing for everybody is to be transformed. And the idea of transformation is going to be changing your outer form to be consistent with your inner reality that is the outside changes to align with the inside that's what transform is so it's specific changes see be transformed mean god is going to change you in in your new birth in your christian life and so be willing for change but what type of change does he want not cultural change not your family tree and you're so-and-so the seventh or so-and-so the eighth, you know, but, you're, but be changed in this way. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
it says here, so this is my point. Unless your mind is renewed as a believer, unless you're renewed, nothing else will make sense to you about what we're going to say to them. It will not. It'll be foolishness to you. You have to start with a renewed mind. And that idea of a renewed mind has to do with making something fresh, making something new, a new development inside of you achieved by God's power. Something fresh begins in you. Remember the Lord said, unless you be converted to become like a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What's the newness? Abba, Father, you're enough. Abba, Father, that's the newness. You're no longer this griping, whining 15-year-old <laughs> or 35-year-old or 45-year-old. You're no longer the entitled, spoiled, whatever old you are. But you're fresh. You're new. Father, I want your will. Father, you're enough for me. Father, lead me in your will. And the Spirit of God, like Galatians says, brings forth the Abba Father out of you. That's a renewed mind. And so the mind changes, and then you're transformed in your outside. The inside changes, and then the outside changes. But what does this change about? Why do we change? <laughs> what are you changing for? Is it good Christian 2.0? Is it good American philanthropist? Is it good European philanthropist? What are you becoming when you're changed? You are coming, you are becoming someone who does the will of God all the time. That's what you become. The Son of God comes forth in you. And he says in Hebrews 10, I have come to do thy will, O God, yea, thy laws within my heart. He always does the things that please the Father. But look at what it says about God's will. Romans 12, 2. So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So here's what this is all about. You are charged with proving God's will. That word prove has to do with test to approve it. That is, you approve something by testing. That is, you come into a situation and you ask questions, like practically speaking. How do you prove a situation is God's will? How do you prove the circumstance, single or married, right? How you know, That's what we're talking about tonight. You ask questions, you seek answers, and you're teachable. You ask, you seek, and you're teachable. And why? Because God does have a good and acceptable and perfect will for everybody. He has a good and acceptable and perfect will in the next hour for you. He does. You know, God is that insanely precise of a planner. He knows what his will is for us. But here's the thing, like the fundamental thing at the beginning of Christian life you have to know, is many of us could refuse the good, acceptable, and perfect. We can refuse it. That's called free will. You could say, no, God, I don't want your call. I want something else. And so you get, instead of the good, you get the mediocre. Instead of the acceptable, you get the so-so, and the perfect will be pretty flawed. That's what you'll exchange. So you got to ask, what do you want? Do you want the, the will of God? See, that's the seriousness of our time tonight. We're not trying to reach out to you and say, God will give you what's ever on your heart. <laughs> I'm not saying that to you. I don't want to say it to you. But God will give you what's ever on his heart for you. That's what he wants to do. What is in his heart for you? And it's always the best. His will is the best. And so it's in that fundamental position you take. So when it comes to single, he has a good example and a perfect will. So we've talked about single and married. So let's just say this. Single and married has to do with the call. But God's call does change. God's call changes in lifetime. Not all the times, but many times. Calling is a gift. And, and when God gives you a gift, he may give you another gift later. I was just at a funeral memorial today for a cousin of mine. And he died two weeks ago today. And he and his wife go to Texas to see their daughter. And he had no plans to die. I'll tell you, he had no plan. He went to Texas to visit his daughter and to do this and that. And there's a text message they show us on the thing today. See you on Monday. I'm coming back on Monday. It might have been that day when he died. So that text message. But the point is that marriage ended for his wife two weeks ago. It's done. He oh. died in an accident. That's the point. She didn't plan it. He didn't plan it. But it's over. So teach us to number our days that we may apply a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12. Every day counts, whether single or married, make every day count. And so every day is awesome in the will of God, whether single or married. Every day is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God, whether single or married. Not a day is wasted in the will of God. That's the safest, best place to be. Because God may call you home, and that's it. So just know that this is a serious thing. And so this is where Christians, especially American Christians, get snared. They think their plans will come to pass. 
James 4 says, wait up, you who say we will go to such and such a city and have a business and, and uh, do this and that. You do not know what your life is. You're just like the wind. You're here and then you're gone. You don't know. Don't say you're going to make all these plans. And instead, you should say, if the Lord will, we shall go in such and such a city. That's James 4, um, 11 through 15. You got to ask if the Lord will. If the Lord will, I remain single. If the Lord will, I get married. Now we're talking about what does it look like if the Lord will? Call of God for, for being single. Here's just a couple of things I want to emphasize about it. When it comes to the call of God for being single, uh, look in 1 Corinthians 7. How would God use you in being single? Just to kind of say it like that. Like, and by the way, everybody's called being single. Everybody on the planet. Because when you're born, you're single. <laughs> when you're a little kid, you're single. Unless those odd things you get, some Middle Eastern countries, maybe four or five, you control it. I don't recommend that. But, I mean, in the flow of God, we're all, yeah, you really are single until, you know, stuff happens. So, you're ever single for a while. But you got to ask, why, why is it about, what is the blessing of being single? And there is a huge blessing in um, being single, a huge blessing. You should never be deceived or deluded that you're less of a person. That is such a lie. To think that you're less a person if you're single. That is simply not true. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. The one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put her strength upon you, but to promote what is appropriate, and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. So being single is an awesome opportunity for undistracted devotion to the Lord. It is an awesome opportunity. And if God gives that to you, run with it with all your heart. But while you're running, he may bring a companion next to you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you might bring another woman or a man who's also running the race of faith. And they come alongside you and you get married. And then two of you run the race, not just one. But know that one of the reasons for being single is that God wants to use you, your focus and your availability. There's an availability, which is wonderful. And it's needed in the body of Christ. It is so needed. I remember a brother, part of a Christian ministry out in Tennessee, wrote about his oldest daughter going to Papua New Guinea. I think it would have been like 1998. And she goes alone as a single sister. And she goes into the highlands. And uh, some of them had never seen a white woman before, a white anybody. And so she shows up and she's alone. There's no support system. There's no like, you know, people with radios and watching her and trying to just her. And she's bringing the gospel. And she had people at home and she got a plane ticket. She got their stuff. Too. But she served the Lord in that area for like two or three years. And many people get saved because she goes. How awesome is that? God can use single men and women in stellar ways. But the point is, do you want to be used? Like, remember Romans 12, 1 and 2. Have you made the initial choices? And so the other thing about being single is you have availability and you're willing to serve where needed. And so one other thing I want to say in Isaiah 58, just to say it quickly. Here's, what, here's where a lot of single people get stuck in a ditch. Now, stuck in a ditch, you know, when cars were first coming forth in, in, in America, especially in the 20s, a lot of cartoons and stuff about you'd see like a Model T on the side of the road and it'd be like in a mud ditch. But people get stuck in a rut at times. Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into the house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Verse 10. And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like new day. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you'll be like a water garden. You will be like, and like a spring of water whose, whose waters do not fail. God will so use the single man or woman 
who gives himself or herself for the hungry, verse 10, and the afflicted. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to bring them into your home, if you're willing to repent of your selfishness, that singleness can breed. Because you have resources, you have time, right? It's so easy to just focus on yourself. If you're willing to repent of that, if you give yourself, God will pour Niagara Falls into, into your living room. I mean, uh, he will bless you and give you light and give you, he says, he will um, satisfy. Uh, the, at, like, at verse 10, if you satisfy the desire of, of the afflicted, you will be satisfied. Verse 11, and satisfy your desire in scorched places. So when you're in scorched places, you'll be satisfied because in verse 10, you help the afflicted. Be a giving single brother or sister. When you give, you will live. If you don't give, you will shrivel up. Guaranteed. I don't see you lose your salvation, but you'll be a miserable person. So don't do that. Just give yourself and, and you'll be so abundant. You know, you'll forget about this, oh, I'm lonely. No, because when you start making relationships, maybe, um, you know, going out to needy kids on your block, needy kids in an orphanage, needy people in college, you fill your home with needy people and you're helping them. Your life is so full. There is no laughing, but you have to do it though. Call of God for being married. Now, what is this thing about being married? Being married is not heaven, okay? It's not heaven. Some people think it is. It is not heaven. It has to do with the will of God. That's where heaven's found, okay? It's not a circumstance. Now, if I could talk to you candidly, I just want to say some candid. I'm going to summarize some things in the scripture, and you can ask me later where this is. So if you think about Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, when the human race starts, the Lord gives a command, and he says um, to, it's talking to Adam, but it's really to Adam and Eve, but Adam's the only one on the block at that time. Uh, Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Now, how are you going to be fruitful and multiply? Children through marriage. That's how it's going to happen. That's how the earth will be filled. This mandate of, of the human race growing, of the human race increasing, it happens through marriage. That is God's plan. Generally speaking, looking at like 1 Corinthians 7 and Genesis 1, generally speaking, many people will be led into marriage if they're willing to be led. I'm not saying everybody. Because of other reasons. Because of the human race type, type of reasons. Because God wants us to be fruitful and, uh, and multiply. But here's three reasons about being married. Now, kind of to take that. First reason, um, uh, apart from that foundational one, in Genesis 2.18, the first reason is companionship. Because he says in 2.18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Companionship. That is awesome. Not to be alone. For the man not to be alone. Because Adam has a job in the garden, and he needs a helper to get the job done. That is the setup. The woman aids the man in doing the work God gives them to do, and they do it together. That is it. That's a picture. It's so blessed. It's, it's, it's so wonderful. If you simply keep that, you'll have such a powerful Christian marriage. Don't lose that. And so it is companionship. Not domineering over each other, not nagging each other. It's companionship, a helper. The woman is a helper. And then the second reason is children. Malachi 2, 15. Why marriage? So it's not primarily personal pleasure. You don't get married primarily for personal pleasure, though there is marriage. It's not the primary reason. It is children, but it's specifically, even more, not just children, like children, and like a number of them, but Malachi 2.15, but not one who has done so who has a remnant of spirit. And, and, and what did that one do? Well, he was seeking a godly offspring. The um, English, uh, take, hey, take heed then your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. The English standard version says, what did God want? A godly offspring. So in this time of Malachi, men were treacherous towards their wives. They're divorced. And like, why are you doing this, Malachi said? God say to them, what are you doing? You are so disobeying God. Because through your marriage, godly children will come forth. And so it's children. The third thing is established homes. That's what he wants for marriage, homes. Because what happens in a home? In a home, there's five things. There's nurturing. There's training, there's outreaching, there's discipling, and then there's sharing and giving. 
That's what should happen. That's God's call. That call of God, right? Not call of culture, not call of America, not call of your parents, but call of God. He wants a Christian home where, or first, you nurture each other. In the home, you find from the mother and father, the children find that nurturing love of God and care. And then there's training. That is, children learn, do this, don't do that. They learn that, right? You, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> you got to train each other you gotta, because we show up flawed with our sinful nature. So you, get, you, you must be trained one way or another. Then there's the outreach because the home is not to be an isolated pleasure castle. Blow up the walls and go out to others. Go out to others. Now, you do need a filter. You don't just want anyone in your home. You got to have some filters. But but generally speaking, it's a place for outreaching. Fourth, it's a place of discipling. You learn the faith. See, second was training. There's training things you just got to do as a human being, as a person, as a man or a woman. What you do as a man or woman is training. But then there's discipling. Discipling is bringing bringing the mind of Christ into everything you do. Not just doing things, but the mind of Christ in it. And then last is sharing and giving. And that's 1 Corinthians 16. The household of Stephanus. Addicted to the ministry of the saints. All these first four lead to the fifth, where you're so strengthening the church. That is, the call of God being married is to have a home that will link with other homes that will link with the house of God. One home partners with the second home, partners with the third home, and those three homes strengthen the house of God. It's marvelous when it happens. So every Christian church should have welcoming, caring, loving homes. That's the call. That's what it should be. Now, we know the call, what should be, is not always what is. Remember that. So how do you go from what is to what should be? How do you do that? And, how, and that's what we're going around. What works against God's call? So let's say this. God wants something, right? But there's so many reasons why it may not happen what he wants. What could that be? According to scripture, the opposition comes from the following. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy us and all Christian relationships in the body of Christ, and especially in marriage and in the family. It is God's purpose for the human race to increase and multiply through marriage and children. And Satan knows this. Satan uses what is already in our hearts and in the world around us. In James 3, 14 through 16, we read, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambitions in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. So we see that one way in which Satan works is through envy and selfishness. When I was a single young adult, I was in a dating relationship with another Christian woman, which became more serious. As I look back, I realize how Satan worked through my selfish ambition to get pleasure, but I didn't see this at the time. And it led to a relationship that was built on pleasure and did not go deep in Christ. Fast forward to my wife and me as a young married couple. I did not realize how selfish I was until I got married. After the honeymoon was over, we began to have arguments and disorder in our marriage. And often it had to do with me not feeling like I was getting my needs met. I was looking through a selfish lens instead of loving my wife as Christ loves the church. Fast forward to family life. The more our family pushes into service of others, the more Satan tries to sow seeds of selfishness and disorder. Our family seems to argue the most when we are getting ready for church in the morning. Or when we are working together on a challenging mission trip or ministry project. Usually the arguments start because one or more of us is feeling stretched and we are not feeling like we are getting our needs met and we take it out on each other. If Satan and his demons can get us to focus so much on ourselves that we argue and can't work together, then our focus will be taken away from Christ and the experience of his love for us and others. And our work together for the gospel will not be as effective. Yes. What he said, this is also what it looks like. The world of flesh and devil. I'm saying a little bit more. What is working against it? Your own heart. Your own heart works against the call of God. Proverbs 28, verse 26. Uh, <clears throat> he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. So don't trust in your impulses. Second is unwillingness to change. Are you, because God's call means change. 
God's call means death to yourself and then the life of Christ. Are you unwilling to change? We'll talk more about it in the questions. Unwise isolation. That is, you do not go out to God's people, the body of Christ. Let me tell you, friends, zero plus zero equals zero. Okay? Zero effort plus zero outgoingness means zero relationship. You realize that. Unwise isolation. Just realize what we're talking about. Fourth, wrong, wrong companions. You got the wrong buddy system. Uh, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. The fools say, ignore God's call, follow your heart. Fifth, your own frantic pace. You're too busy for God's call. You've scheduled it out of your life. You've, you have, you, you've loaded your life with so many other things that are a waste of time. And I know what it is with kids to waste my time. I know what it is to do things I don't need to do and then ignore things I should be doing. Watch your pace. And then last, pursuit of wealth and comfort. Luke 12, 15, the Lord said, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of possessions. Not even when you have an abundance. Your life is not there and you're stuck. But why are you running after stuff? Don't run after stuff. What resources does God give us? He gives us prayer, gives us counsel from wise believers. He gives us fellowship with wise believers. So, and, and direction for, for the word. That is, ask, seek, and knock, pray consistently, not say a prayer. Don't say a prayer, but pray. That's different. Second, you need, you need counsel. That is, you need someone to sit you down and say, brother, sister, let me share with you some things. We need that. And more than one person, by the way. In the abundance of counselors, there's victory. Third, but fellowship we need. Not only hear what they say, but live with others who are wise. Because you learn more from how people behave than what they say. So you need to be with wise people, not just hear from them. And then the word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So I want to read some questions about how to th think about these things. First question, when is the right time to seek a wife or husband? And here's a companion question. What maturity level is encouraged prior to even dating or courtship up to marriage? What type of maturity level should, should you have? And at what time in life should someone consider the commitment of marriage? So this is a timing issue. I would just, uh, I'm going to be blunt and quick and not, not dance around it. You should, you should see a husband and wife as soon as you are ready in the will of God to. I don't say be frantically and do it right now. I don't mean that. I'm not saying impulsively go flirting or something. I don't say that at all. But the timing of life, right? And, and this is what I uh, mean by that. As, at, as soon as God has brought you to maturity, the maturity of that commitment, and in fellowship with other counsel and people talking with you, you don't have to put it off. The average age of marriage, I, I kind of saw it uh, bump around a little bit. Sometimes it's 34, sometimes it's 37, sometimes it's 32. So people are, now, now a lot of people aren't even getting married in the state. They are, they are immoral. They are just shacking up and they're living together. And that's a disaster. That's a, that's a moral disaster. Some Christians are in that, by the way. But we're talking about marriage, right? Maybe like a century ago or so, the average age was like 21 for a woman. About 100 years ago, it was 21 for a woman and like 24 for a man. It was much younger than the past. When it comes to timing, some things about timing and things that people may do to uh, put off. Today, there's a lot of things that people do to, you know, put off marriage. One is education. It could be owning a house, well, and all the different things. As you put it off, you, you end up with more consequences, more temptation for immorality. You know, you think of people that don't get married, there's the temptation to have an abortion. You know, there's all these consequences down the line that happen when you put them off for whatever reason. You might want to go travel the world before you get married. You might want to go to college. You might want to get a better job. You might want to build up wealth, you know. But it all puts off this, this um, choice of choosing to have a certain sort of pleasure in a right relationship and following God's plan prior to any sort of pleasure. The longer you wait, the harder it gets to change. 
I'm not saying you need to get married, but I'm, and you do not need to get married. But I'm saying to you real realistically, the longer a single woman, a woman or a man waits, the more stuck in their ways they get. Now, God still gets people married. God's good. So I'm not saying you can't get married later in life. Absolutely not saying that. I'm just say, talking realistically to you because the question is timing. Is that people build habits of independence and maybe they get a college degree and maybe, you know, so okay, candidly, if Ephesians 5 says a, uh, a woman is to submit to her, her a husband in everything, it's really hard if you're college educated, you got 200000 a year salary, and everyone calls you the boss at work. It's hard. That says be realistic. If she's the boss at work, can she flip the role? Can she? With God, all things are possible. <laughs> I know, but it's very hard. And so women and men, they make a trade. They trade the marriage opportunity when they're young for the travel and the money and the whatever. So be careful what you trade. Be careful. I'm not, you just got to be very careful because the culture says live for yourself and have kids later. You know, that's what the culture says. The call of God is a different thing. So just, just think about that. Anything you want to add to that? Something about education. And you had some thoughts I've heard about education, college, and it's not where you're going to. Um, become more mature because yes. of the things that go on in college. So think about a four-year college. By the way, there's nothing wrong going to college. I'm not saying you can never go to college. My point's not that. But you got to realistically look at where the things they are. Don't have a wish dream, a wish dream, and you, you, you live in, in an illusion. Generally speaking, most four-year colleges with dorm life, I mean public and private, from coast to coast in this country, in this country, uh, you go into there, you're in the dorms. And for four years, you're in a, a world of suspended animation. That is, you, you're, 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 your maturity level is in this bubble where maybe you got student loans, you're not working, and you're just going to class all the time. Going to classes, and you go to parties, and you stay up late, and you fall asleep in the library studying. Yeah. I remember falling asleep in the library and I was studying as a master I put my head on three in the morning studying for a final. My client was at USC. My, there, there I was. My head's on the desk studying for my final. God can mature you in that type of environment. But just ask, what are you doing? Most people, when they get a social science degree, maybe they've got to go to Starbucks. Maybe they work at Home Depot. Because they can't get it. Well, nowadays, people aren't working. So maybe you could get a job because they're, they're getting free got government money. But college, college now is not like maybe in the past maybe in a century ago or something. It's a different world. Generally speaking, college has become a, uh, become a pathway of uh, being indoctrinated, of being pampered, of being flattered, and of being, um, you know, uh, taught to do things a certain way. Now, you could come, come out of it, you know, maybe a doctor, a lawyer, and just, so there's some good in that. There are some good things to do in college and in that way. But the general trend, it's not a magic wand that makes you a mature person. And especially there's a lot of party schools in this country, a lot of them. You just got to know it's out there and it's real. The world is partying to the end of the world. To the end, they're partying, okay? They're not stopping until yeah. it's over. Christians should stop now. Never start, by the way. <laughs> but if you have to start, stop. So that's what's happening in college. Generally speaking, some colleges are good. If, if, if you can get to college where there's good discipling, there's accountability, there's closeness, and there's mature people there. Hey, that's great. That's great. But there's not many like that. Not many. So you just got to know what, what you're doing. And the church is called the house of God. And so it's really in family life that you uh, learn or grow in the church. And you're learning responsibilities, faithfulness, commitment. So in your own home and in the family of God is where you're going to get um, maturity. If that's what you really want. And I think if you know the call of God for you in the future is to marry, then um, that's what you should be striving for is maturity. Yes. And so if you're in college, uh, be committed to a really good church. Be accountable in that church. Don't visit one day a week. Right. That's, that's lame. That is so lame. Yeah. Be accountable seven days a week where you are if you're in college in that church to the church leadership. Or you can try and be with families who are in that church, right? And so you're in college, but you're busy in the homes all the time. You're, you're, you're not the dorm is in your home if it doesn't have to be. You're with uh, other Christians who are helping you and, you know, if you're a single person. Do that instead. And then that could be helpful. Next question. If the Lord calls someone to marry, does he have a specific person for them besides just another Christian and a companion? 
How do I know if a person is right for me in accordance to God? How do you know if this brother or sister is the one you should marry? Does God just have one particular person he's prepared for you to marry? Yes, I think God does have someone for you to marry. If you're not married, by the way. <laughs> if you're married, you're married, you're married, you're in it. Okay, so God bless you in it. But if you're not married, he does. He does. Uh, it's not just a, It's not just you're throwing a dart at the dartboard. I hope the dart hits. I'm going to, whoo, here goes my dart. Where's it going to hit? You know, you know, dartboard, will I hit the bullseye or will I be kind of close to bullseye? It's not a game of, of throwing darts. It's very much, um, I, I do believe God has a particular person. Now, how God does that, we don't always, we don't know. Like, we don't know all the ins and outs of that. But, but why do I say that? In Genesis 24, Abraham's servant is seeking a bride for Isaac. And uh, he travels like hundreds of miles to Mesopotamia. And he doesn't even know the name of Rebecca, but he's praying before he shows up. And he prays his prayer. Uh, as, he's, as, as he enters a city, he says, Behold, I am standing by the spring, verse 13, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. So he's praying, show me by being at the well and, and, and the woman's willing to serve. He's saying, this woman will serve. And by the way, when you water camels, not easy. Not easy job. Uh, you got to be a little tough. <laughs> yeah, they're smelly too. Okay. And so she's, she's going to water the camels. Gonna, and so he says, show me the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. Three times this is repeated in Genesis 24. Three times he's saying that. So know that the repetition is the Holy Spirit trying to show us something. Remember, it's the call of God we're talking about. We're not talking about anything you could do. God's not like twisting your arm, man. Okay, man, I'm going to twist your arm. Don't talk to that other girl. This is the only one you can... Like, he's not like dragging you around and forcing you not to... You have a free will, guys. But I'm talking to guys, right? And, and, and my thought is, Men in the body of Christ initiate courtship. If you're going to initiate marriage, you better initiate courtship. If you're going to be a leader in marriage, then you better start the thing. Don't let the lady flirt with you and then kind of, oh, I better marry you. You better know God's mind. Don't, don't let someone flirt and get your eyes. But having said that, we just need to know God's initiative and leading. Uh, but but he, I think he does have a specific person. How do we know if they're right for you? That's a good question. And the multitude of counselors are safety. Rebecca gets chosen for Isaac through uh, two ways. Through, through the community. It was through community and it was through counsel. Community and counsel was what happened for the bride to make it to Isaac. It's community, the community of God's people that will keep all you single people safe, generally speaking. And the counsel is how God can lead you to, 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 to the right person. So, yes, I, I do strongly believe that. Don't learn by watching all the bad examples. Right. There's many bad examples. <laughs> Don't let the bad examples be your teaching, okay? Don't say, well, they did this, so I can do it. Okay. What does scripture say? And people actually are led by the Lord in wonderful ways. One thing I, I, I would say to brothers is, I think for sisters, they're looking for men who would be good fathers and men who would be committed. And then... Maybe for a brother, they're looking for a wife who can be in the home and take care of the home and support and respect the brother. Yes, because one of the questions say, what is a good age to start a marriage or, or is it a matter of maturity to seek a wife or husband? It's totally a matter, matter of maturity. It's not a matter of age so much. It's maturity. But you can be mature at a young age. It's not primarily uh, age. It's primarily maturity. So, so to answer the question, is the guy right for me? Is the girl right for me, right? So to answer that type of question. Because Rebecca was asked, do you want to go? And she said, yes. So sisters do need to agree or not agree, right? And just because a guy pays attention to you doesn't mean that's the guy. Sisters, don't be fooled by uh, flattery or by attention. Don't be fooled by flattery or attention. Because you can be tricked with the wrong guy. You don't want that to happen to you. That's why you don't do things in secret. You don't secretly court or secretly do it. It'll be a disaster for you nine times out of ten. 
maybe one time out of 10, you don't get a crash, but many times it'll, it'll be a disaster to be secretive. So the wife asks candidly, what type of man is this? Will he stick with me for life? Will he be a good, or, or will he learn a good father? Will he become a good father? I mean, not that you're, uh, you got to be a father to be a father, right? So we can see you're not a father yet. You got to get there to be a father. So it's not like you know everything, but, but are, are, are you in the trend of commitment? Are, are you committed to being a father? And will the wife be committed to taking care of the home? Will the wife watch the home and will the husband watch the family? You know, that's those types of things. The epic, iconic picture, I think, from the 60s is a nice girl from the suburbs loving a biker. And the guy has long hair. He has his bike. I've seen it in some pictures of the past. And it's like, people say, well, why does she love that guy? I have seen these things in certain movies and times. It's an exaggeration, but it's not too far off the truth. Or sometimes a girl could fall for someone. Say, why are you falling for that guy for? You know, people are looking around. And it's so important that the family of God speaks into a courtship when needed. When needed, speak into the courtship. Speak into it. I'm, not, I'm telling you as a family, all of you here, I'm not saying you all have something to say, but some of the family of God need, needs to speak into those people. You don't want them alone just figuring it out by their heart flutter, by their heart flutter to get married or not. That's not it at all. Because someone could see things about the guy you don't see. Like when Cynthia and I were courting, we had people talking to us apart from each other. And, and, and I remember the other brother saying to me, now, do you really want to get married? Do you really want this commitment? You, this is going to mean this. It's going to mean this. He was telling me what it meant. Okay, well, yes, I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I do. But I had to be told, you know, I had to, you know, be realistically told and, you know, marriage is not going to have difficulties and disagreements and so forth. By the way, it really helps to become godly before you get married and you have less disagreements about marriage. But if you get married, God will do it anyway. <laughs> I'm just saying, so the single, rejoice in being single, God's getting you ready. But um, it's so important to, to know those things. So this is a, a really good side question. Do people in the Western world, including Christians, complicate being single and married more than it ought to be? Do people in the Western world complicate this thing? I think we do. And I think we do because we have wealth and we have options. Because we have wealth and because we have options, we complicate our life. Uh, and, you know, um, wealth is a stewardship, but you've got to handle it carefully. Because the Lord said in Luke 12, he says this really um, like strongly, like if you could get in a brother or sister's situation later, if, if you see them in, in trouble in this way, the Lord says in Luke 12, he says, um, he says in verse 15, take heed and be aware of covetousness. Be on guard against every form of covetousness. Because you could be hit with covetousness so quickly. Get the four-year degree and then get the two-year degree, and then get the PhD, and then get married. And, and, and normally people are doing that for career satisfaction or for money. That's the, that's the normal, normal reason. You just got to be thoughtful about it. So we do complicate it. And so don't think living in the West is superior like living in other countries. We don't want to be infected with a cultural uh, pride about it. Just got to walk, uh, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Now, other countries may have technological like less than America. Having technology, technological advantages does not mean you're morally superior. It just means life's a little more complicated. You can do more with it, but you could also mess your life up. So just know that wisdom is what's valuable. Wisdom. Not so much wealth, but, but wisdom. That is what makes you great in life. And then, uh, must a single person get married in the same church or not in the same church? That's a question like, Say, say if you're single, should you marry someone in your church? Like, do you have to marry someone in your church? That's what they're asking. Or can it be in some other church? Point three, unwise ice isolation. So here's the thing I see a lot with, with Christians. Say you're, say you're, say you're, okay, say you're, <laughs> enjoy life at 15, okay, don't worry about it. But say, you know, 20, 18, 20, you're thinking about marriage, okay? So you look around your church. Say, well, hmm, there's only like 30 people here and 20 of them over 60. <laughs> so, you know, I think my situation is a little limited. You know, you can say that. Okay, so you kind of think that. And so, like, what am I going to do? You know, like, I'm being practical with you. And, you. and so this is what I would say to you. Learn to be where God's people are that you can get married to. Go to where they are. 
Don't expect them to knock down your door and kick down your door and flood in your living room tomorrow. Go to where they are. This is what I mean. Um, uh, so this is just an example. I'm not saying you guys, I'm going to give you three examples real quick of, of, of what I'm talking about. When you travel, visit with God's people whom you don't know, but you know from, from other people's testimony that they're walking with the Lord. Visit other Christian families you don't know. Visit them. We were in Arizona. And so we're out in Arizona for this crazy two and a half day trip. It was like full. Every, every hour was like maxed out. And so we visit this homeschooling family in a Glendale, Arizona. Never met him. Never did. But I met him through a service called Candle in the Window, a godly Christian hospitality network. I let him know, hey, I'm coming to town. I just want to come say hi. So we go and we say hi. We drove 35 minutes. And the reason why we did that is because the scripture says to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call the Lord out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22. So I tell my kids, we need as many godly friends as possible. And the godly friends aren't necessarily there with you every day, but you're making friends around the country. Make friends in different cities who love the Lord. They are there, but you've got to go out and get them and go see them. There's things called scriptoriums, which are around the country. And, and the scripture recitation sessions. Our family went to one in Huntington uh, Beach like a month ago. And we met people we never met before. And we're just talking, we're sitting at the table, fellowshipping and all this stuff. So you meet people. If you want to be married, you must be known, okay? You must be known. Now, I'm not saying to you, go to people and be a beggar. Just seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So as you're seeking in, in the family of God, right? The family of God. God will lead you, but you got to get out. But I'm, I'm being candid with you. There's, there's other things to say to that. But you do have to avoid unwise isolation. If we walk in the light and see is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We have fellowship one with another in the light. You want to marry someone who's in the light. That's who you want to marry. They're in the light and they're walking in the light too. And by the way, the older you get, you know what happens to you when uh, you get older? You get more picky. You get really picky. And the list gets longer. Maybe you're a woman who says, this guy has to be this and this and this and this and this. And you got the perfect list. Oh, that guy, no. He missed one out of ten. Forget it. Uh, and you get really picky. Now, I'll tell you, I say this from, from, from very close experience on some things. <laughs> there are people who are um, maybe in a situation where they could really get married. Okay. So say if you're in a, a situation where you're kind of interested, like girls, guy, guy, or girl, and something comes up, right, in the talking with each other. And maybe it's like a theological issue. And so, bum, 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 bum. And so you got to say, you got to say, is this issue worth not having that person as my spouse? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Like, if, if this man could be a godly husband and be with me for life and take care of the kids and love me as Christ loves the church and say you're the woman, do I need to force him into my religious mold? Do I need to force him into my, you know, particular spin on, on a doctrine? Do I need to do that? Now, there's some things, like, if he says... Christ is created and you earn your salvation by works, then keep looking, girls. Okay? <laughs> keep looking so you know, you know, not that guy. But I mean within the evangelical Christian world, you know, there's all sorts of doctrinal things. You can be so picky, you lose the person because you're so critical. And same towards a girl, towards a guy. You got to ask the big questions. You can't just be so critical of things. You got to ask the bigger things. What type of woman, what type of man will they be? That's what really matters. And then things can be changed, changed later in marriage. Isn't it that the sister should be more moldable? Because in marriage, the sister's identity becomes the husband. Isn't the sister the one that should be more teachable, be more moldable? If the sister shows that she's able to change to mold, you know, to be the person she's according to that person's way of thinking, isn't that a good thing? That's a very good thing. Because in Genesis 2, Eve is the helper. And the helper adapts. The helper has to adapt and flex to the one being helped. The helper is not the boss. Remember that. Helper is not the boss. Helper is the helper and the boss the boss. And so you just know the arrangements. And I don't mean it in any way. So 
a, a woman in no in no way is less than a man. Okay, there's nothing in fear superior. It's just position of responsibility in marriage. There's nothing to do with your essence. The essence is equally glorious in Christ, but you have different roles. So the woman is called to give up, you might say, her identity and and adapt her husband's I I identity and become one with her husband. Absolutely. So that is the flow. But that's after marriage. Like, if you are thinking about getting married to someone, then I don't think you have to, like, just be like, oh, he believes this, so maybe I should change that. Like, I don't know, it's just because it's not, you haven't decided on it yet. Like, the commitment isn't there yet. So I don't think that, like, I don't necessarily think that it has to be that way. If you're just trying to see if that's God's will or not. Yeah, it, it just depends on what it is you're talking about. It depends. So if you're in a place of courtship, and, and so can I just lay out what I'm talking about, what, what I would believe a God-honoring way to uh, uh, proceed is. We don't believe in date randomly and hoping your emotional bell rings with some girl one day or some guy one day. We do believe, uh, my wife and I believe, so we're speaking to you as one couple, a Christian brother has a mind of Christ, and he's praying, and there's a Christian sister somewhere. So he initiates something. That's what we're talking about, just you know. And so... It's initiated. And so the Christian sister will respond and say yes or no. And by the way, uh, my beautiful wife said no to me at first. <laughs> she said no to me. It was quite a, a drama and a thing we went through. And then God uh, changed it because I persisted. <laughs> and so I had to learn and, and, you know, stuff like that. But seeing each other does not equal marriage. So when you're seeing each other, in a sense, the woman's not the place of being the wife. No, it, there, there is still an independence there. Absolutely. Positively, yes. And so, but, but the young girl has to consider, do I want to turn the corner now? Do I want to tr- turn the corner and, and, and where is a place where I'm going to uh, cooperate and obey and all that stuff? Well, do, do I want to do that? That's what you got to ask yourself. And so I'm, I'm just saying to the group, you have to be willing to ask that question and, and, and know the implications of it. I'd say probably if you're seeking someone to marry that you'd want, like as a woman, see, you know, looking into someone who's interested in that, you would really want to make sure that that husband's someone who's following the Lord where you want to follow them as they're following the Lord. If that's not the case, like, don't even consider it. You know? Yes. And I think also kind of going back to the thought of going to another fellowship or another group of people to find a spouse or kind of networking in that way. It's really, I think, a challenge for young people to go to church and have their mind on a courtship or a marriage and not on the Lord. Like your 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 first priority becomes the last priority or second priority. Third. You know, if the Lord's not the focus, if it's networking or looking for a spouse, when you're supposed to wor- be worshiping the Lord or be, you know, learn from the word, you're really probably going backwards in your walk with the Lord. Amen. Yeah. You know? So really making sure like check your heart, check your motives. Why are you really going to church? Is it to find a spouse or is it because you want to follow the Lord and the Lord's going to bring in the spouse? Amen. I was just thinking, I totally agree with that idea that your eyes should be on the Lord, first and foremost. I was thinking a while back, you you said something about, in answer to the question, does God have a specific person for you? And I think more broadly, I agree, yes, God has a specific person for you to marry. But I think more broadly, God has a specific everything for you. (laughs) He has a specific will for every aspect of your life. And, yeah. and so your, your focus gets misplaced if you start you know, chasing after these individual things, whether it be a, a career or even a marriage, right? Uh, it's not like chasing a marriage is better than chasing a career. They're both wrong because you're not supposed to be chasing anything. You're supposed to be pursuing the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and trusting him that if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, if you block out all those other things, distractions and you focus on 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 him and pleasing him and and devoting your life to him in his service and and loving his people living for him as a as a bright shining light and testimony in this dark world if you if you prioritize those things then you can trust god that he will provide for you and and so that means he'll provide a career path for you that makes sense for your personality and for your skills uh, he'll, he'll provide a, a partner for you in marriage as, as a helper. If you're a man, or he'll provide that, that, that godly man that you need as, as the father for your children. Like those things are not to be pursued. Uh, the Lord is to be pursued, and you trust him to provide. And so I think that, that God has a specific everything for you is the way I would summarize that. 
uh, uh, thank, thank you, brother. So here's the incredible dance as a Christian. We're in the world, but not of the world. We have opportunities, but should we take them? Because everything has a cost. If you give four years of your life, or like I gave six years of my life to education, it's fine. You know, I'm not, it's not that it's bad to do. Just know everything has a cost. Everything has an implication. So I am purposely trying to say something different from the culture. I totally agree with Stephen. God bless you. I'm with them. I'm with them. But I'm just trying to make a different emphasis because you don't hear it that much where, where we are. We're having a lunch in, um, in Grand Junction, Colorado with people we had never met, okay, until that weekend. We're coming through, stay with some family. And the dear Christian family was there. And uh, what did the uh, young wife say? Remember that? She was 19, just newly married, and she said she went from living in her father's home to li- to being married right away, and that she was pleasantly surprised at that because she was. It's like nothing really changed because she was already, you know, prepared in the home to have her own home. So we just say that to open your mind to possibility. We're not saying that's the way to do it for everybody. We're saying that is one way. She went straight from high school into marriage. And she was so happy. Not everyone is like called to do that. But some people would never even think of it because of the culture. Right. Because the culture tells them never do that. The culture says never should you do that. You should always do this. That's what we're saying. No, no, no. Listen to the call of God. Be, remember, willing to change. Flexible. Uh, the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. That's, that's what we're saying to all of us here tonight. Naturally, I'm a shy person, so I want to speak for those who are shy. And like I was kind of like a, a wallflower and not noticed. And I realized at one point in my single life that I could serve the Lord and at the same time be, be um, made known. So it's like I don't think a person should feel guilty that they're trying to you know make themselves known but they could do it at the same time as serving the lord too that's how you become yeah. known by other people otherwise you would never have noticed me amen yeah <laughs> i saw you serving the lord and it wasn't to get something she wasn't doing christian work to get something you know get what i'm saying she's just out of love for christ that's 24 karat gold person when, when they're doing that Two last questions I wanted to get, because they're, they're, they're different ones, but they're good for us to consider. I am a middle-aged single woman. Though I had a desire to be, I never married. In the church, it seems that single women of a certain age tend to fall through the cracks. I am content with the Lord, but would still welcome marriage. Is this a realistic expectation? So this is a woman, uh, not in her 60s, but uh, early 50s. And so, like, is it a realistic expectation? Because single women tend to be neglected. And I'm just going to say something about the, the church, like the whole body of Christ. There is a failure in the church to disciple each other. There's a failure in the church to welcome single people into homes. There's a failure where single people drift. And they have no real home, not that they don't want it, you know. But the families are not opening their home to, to everyone in the church. And so the families, and I don't mean just families, everybody, single people at the home are family, right? But I'm just talking about a family, like her question is being single. They slip to the cracks because some Christian families are just selfish. And they're in a church and they're living for themselves. They're not living for others. That's why that happens. And so may the Lord help all of us, right, hearing this, to do the U-turn right now. I know, maybe you did the U-turn already. But my hope is my home is open to any of God's people. My, my door is open. If you have a family, a Christian family, open your door to God's people. And so just however you can, you can't always do the most. I'm just saying something. But is it a realis- realistic expectation for an uh, older single woman to get married? Yes, it is. Of course it is. But here's, here's the thing to say about that. you got to ask yourself, God is the giver of the call, like when God calls you to marry, that's our position, right? Someone could always find someone to get married. You can always go online and, you know, find some guy somewhere and just marry him. You could, I mean, in our, our, our culture, very possible. But you could say the realistic expectation is that you can cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. And God so deeply cares for you, dear single sister, that he will perfectly take care of you. And with the other things we talked about, your life will be bursting with meaning, whether or not you're married. But God can absolutely uh, direct you. He can. So the question is yes. There's nothing hopeless about that situation. 
And so the last question is in marriage. This is someone in marriage. This is a wife writing about a husband. When a serving brother gets burned out in church service, what could a helper wife do in addition to praying for the poor brother? Could you and your wife please both share specific examples from your marriage? What worked? What didn't? Thank you. So the, the wife is more walking with the Lord and the husband's burned out. The husband's kind of paused in his Christian work. So what could she do in addition to praying? That's a great question. I tend to think, you know, this isn't a rule, and I don't, but I just want to say something. In the Gospels, it's the women who go to the tomb. The women are at the tomb. The women are pretty much at the cross. I think John, John was there, because the Lord said, behold your mother. John's there. So sometimes, not everywhere, but sometimes the sisters are, you know, want to walk the Lord. They're saying, guys, where are you? Let's <laughs> walk the Lord. And the, and the sisters want direction and leadership, but the guys are floundering a bit in, in marriage. What the sister can do, I would say, it says in uh, 1 Peter 3, she can, in all reverence and cheerfulness, run the home. So even though the guy is in the dumps, the woman is cheerful, taking care of things, gracious, complimentary, and just the power, you might say, of that undeserved kindness will change the guy's heart, nine times out of ten. Because it says that in 1 Peter, that's how a wife wins a husband who, who disobeys the word, by that kind and it's without a word, he, she wins him. There's no words. Like, you blew it. I'm not saying, saying. You're just in the kindness and the love, but you're practically running the home like you're an active woman. You're practically running it, and, and, and you're around the man. You're around him in kindness and love and care, and you're speaking into him all that you can. I agree with that. I think okay, the helper would, in, in her support role, I think that would so highly encourage um, the man to, to maybe get back on track. As the wife is reading the word and asking questions of her husband, hey, can you help me understand this so he could participate or sharing maybe something the Lord put on her heart that when she was reading might stir him up to get back into reading the Amen, word. Yeah. Kind of provoke, provoke them to seek the Lord. When you know, it says that the wife is to respect the husband, reverence. That reverence is power and not fake reverence, not fake where you kind of pretend it. But the husband knows the wife's genuine because you live together, right? That, that lifts him up in a way that he can't lift himself up. That's why he needs a helper. That's why Adam needs a helper. He needs, a, he needs help. Anything to add to that? Your love for the word of God, love for the Lord can stir your husband up. And it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? If he's kind of in a slump in his faith, when you're reading the word of God and you're sharing with him what you got out of it, sharing with him uh, what you got out of the Bible studies, asking him, what do you think that means? And then listening to him carefully and then saying, wow, you really know the word really well. I would love to hear you, you know, share more and, you know, just share with him. Maybe this is the case. You have a gift and just really encourage him. You really know the word well and, and, uh, you should let other people um, hear what you have to say because I think they can be really encouraged by you. I think that's, to me, a start. Amen. Here's the key in the sister's question. Burned out. That's the key word, burned out. So here's the say, thing I say to all you men here. Young men and men, don't dig a hole for yourself with the wrong work. Don't do the wrong Christian work because some of it's a waste of time just because it's Christian, right? Remember, the Lord said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So what is the yoke of Christ for a father, husband, brother? I would tend to say it has to do more with shepherding, directing, studying the word. Saying, I don't believe like only one guy in a church should know the word. All the men should know the word. All the men should study the word. All the men should share the word somehow, but not from the pulpit necessarily, but all the men in a place, you know, uh, husbands. So uh, why? So I say that to this woman encourage the man to study the word encourage him to let go of commitments that would would burn him out because some things will burn you out stop the time would you guys say it in a gentle way as a question do you think this would really help you do you think it's the best you and then pray for him because uh, you're a helper right the wife's a helper so help the man to be redirected into service that refreshes him because he was he was a, a a genuine man at one point you're genuine but he got burned out that totally happens so Christian men need to have vision. What should we do with our marriages, homes, and families? Not just do anything. So some things you got to cut out, some things you got to start doing. And may the Lord give us wisdom in, um, in doing that. Again, we're, we're seeking in the will of God 
the good and acceptable and perfect situation for everybody and to put it out there and the spirit of God moves amongst the saints in our hearts because he lifts up the Lord Jesus in our hearts and we're drawn to him and wherever we are we can say where Jesus is tis heaven there single or married I'm already enjoying heaven because Jesus is in my life working in my life so Lord bless you all with this consideration tonight